before uh, we talk about what materialism and idealism are, they are the sort of the two main camps that all of philosophy has been divided into for the for uh, millennia, um, really, since the origins of philosophy. You had this division. Um, but I'll start by explaining what they're not. Obviously, uh, idealism and materialism are not what they are in the, pop in the pop popular consciousness, if you like. You know, obviously, materialism is associated with the, uh, the grubby preoccupation with wealth and material things, whereas, obviously, idealism is associated with you know, the pursuit of the loftier things in life, you know, equality and justice and you know, self-sacrifice are associated with idealism. Materialism and idealism, obviously, in philosophy, have a very different meaning to that. And uh, I'll just start by outlining what materialism and idealism mean to philosophers because they touch upon questions of the relationship between mind and matter. Uh, the idea of, you know, what is reality? What is true and false? Uh, how can we distinguish truth and falsehood? Um, and for the materialists, uh, which we as Marxists define ourselves as materialists, describe ourselves as materialists, and in fact materialism lies at the root, uh, either unconsciously or consciously, of all natural science really. It is uh, an instinctive materialism lies at the basis of all natural science. And materialism simply explains that all that exists is matter in motion, that there is a world, an objective world of matter that exists independently of the human mind and that the relationship between mind and matter is a similar relationship between the part and the whole. That uh, mind is one of the products of matter in motion. That it is the product of the human brain which itself is the product of the uh, a long period of evolution, of revolutions in the organisation of matter, from the most simple up to the most complex forms of matter, and it is one of the products of this. Uh, it emerges from matter organised in the human brain. And ideas are not something which are planted in our head uh, from either God or the devil, but ideas themselves are a reflection in the material brain within the human mind of the world external to us, and an interpretation and a reflection upon that world. And as I say, uh, human, the human brain is itself the long period, uh, the, the product of a long period of hundreds of millions of years of evolution of matter from lower, less uh, complex to higher, more complex forms of uh, organisation, starting with the transition uh, billions of years ago from uh, inorganic to organic matter. The same substances organised in a certain way were... Uh, um, led to the emergence of life and over hundreds of millions of years of course we had the domination of simple unicellular organisms and then about 550 million years ago we have a huge explosion a revolution uh, within the, uh, the animal kingdom within the, the sphere of biology and the emergence of complex organisms during the Cambrian explosion and one of those uh, organisms um, led to what we call the chordates a particular branch of organisms which led to vertebrates where the, the, you had the emergence of a primitive spinal column the centralization of the, of the nervous system and increasingly at the head of this central nervous system the brain which emerged uh, instead of simply transmitting from the sense organs to the motor organs increasingly uh, found, formed connections with itself the neurons increasingly formed connections with themselves reflected upon the world interpreted the information of the world around us formed memories which obviously helped in the uh, evolution of the you know the survival of these species and eventually over hundreds of millions of years we've seen uh, the growth of the brain and then a quantum leap that separates human beings from at the entire animal kingdom and the emergence of human consciousness as you had this transformation of quantity into quality. But in the story of the emergence of human consciousness and the emergence of human beings from the animal kingdom, you actually have an interesting little uh, uh, diversion. About a hundred years ago, you had the discovery of a fossil. It was actually a, uh, a, a giant hoax called the Piltdown Man, which completely had the, uh, the scientific community enthralled to it. It, it. it suckered in a lot of scientists. And basically, it was an orangutan skull. Uh, no, it was a human skull with an orangutan's jaw attached to it. And it, it, that reflects quite a deep-set prejudice about how humanity emerged from the animal kingdom. That what we were looking for in the missing link was basically uh, an ape-like creature with a human-like brain. That essentially that uh, consciousness occupies a certain pedestal, if you like. It is raised above uh, the rest of the material world. In actual fact, decades before the discovery of the Piltdown Man, Engels actually wrote a book called The, uh, the Part Played Like by Labour in the transition from apes, sorry, an article, a very excellent article, called The Part Played by Labour in the Transition from Ape to Man, and he describes in this uh, article how uh, actually the key turning point in the transition from ape to man was not so much the emergence of an ape with a, with a giant head, if you like, but was actually when uh, human beings, that, or our ancestors, hominids two to three million years ago, started to stand upright. 
And by doing so, they freed the hand, which allowed all sorts, millions of, uh, an infinite number of complex operations that we can change the world around us. And this is what actually separates us as human beings from the rest of the animal kingdom, is an ability to not take nature simply as it is, but to alter nature according to our will. If you like, the, the, the animal kingdom, all of the most intelligent animals are very much slaves to the concrete, to their immediate experience and immediate environment. But we see that human beings are very much distinguished by being able to uh, project ourselves into the future, to think abstractly, to plan and develop our, how we're going to actually change the world. If you look at the most primitive human stone axe uh, and compare that with the tools that are used by uh, the, the, the higher forms of the animal kingdom apart from human beings, you see that uh, the most primitive stone axe uh, shows a level of planning that, that this was constructed in that primitive human mind before it was actually constructed materially. Whereas the animals take what is concrete in front of them, they take the stick or the stone and so forth and, uh, and manipulate the world in that way, you know, use the rock to break up a, a piece of fruit or a nut and so on. Whereas we construct things within our minds, we're able to uh, form very high levels of abstraction and we're able to pass those on through the means of language. And so actually by transforming the world through the means of labour created by the hand, human beings transforming their own environment actually transform themselves. They give an impulse to the evolution of the brain, which happens uh, after actually the, the emergence of the upright stance, posture and, and the hands. Um, but it is interesting that what this, uh, this sort of like hoax of the Piltdown Man says. And uh, it, it shows that there is actually a prejudice, a tendency to rise, raise consciousness above the material world. And there is actually an entire camp of philosophy, the, uh, the, the, the camp of idealism, into this, uh, which opposes itself to materialism, which inverts the relationship between mind and matter. It doesn't say that matter is primary and consciousness forms out of uh, that, is a product of matter emotion. But on the contrary, it is our thought, our minds, it is consciousness which is something primary which gives rise to the material world. Either it's the mind of man or the mind of God, which is primary, and the material world is secondary. It's either a reflection of this mind, you know, everything is a product of our mind, or, 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 and so on. It's an interesting philosophical inversion. And Engels describes, and this is where I want to actually begin, really, is that Engels describes how, you know, in the human, in the human eye, what, on the retina, the external world is reflected in an upside-down way. The image is upside-down on the human retina. And we explain that through the physics of optics. Um, and uh, in, in the same way, of course, in, in idealist philosophy, you have this inversion of the relationship between mind and matter. And that too must be explained, but it must be explained through the laws of history, of historical materialism, explaining how our ideas are a reflection of the material world around us. And, and uh, as, as we continue to change the material world, uh, it didn't obviously stop two to three million years ago with the emergence of human beings, uh, um, if you like, when evolution stopped. We continue to change our consciousness. We continue to change our ideas when we change the material world around us. As we change our conditions, we, we lay the basis for new thoughts, new ideas, new levels of culture and so on. And so obviously the emergence of this split within idealism and materialism has to first of all be explained. <coughs> Uh, but secondly, I think this is something that a lot of Marxists are guilty of uh, on occasion, uh, not all Marxists, but sometimes I think we can very much simplify idealism. We can uh, give it, uh, not give it the credit that is actually due to it, uh, because of course we associate idealism, the idea that mind is primary, with, with mysticism, with religion, and uh, with, the, the organi with organized religion, the church and so forth, which of course the church is the last bastion of idealist philosophy. Um, however, there are, of course, attempts to wrap up idealism in a much more scientific-sounding language, even in materialistic-sounding language. There are much more subtle arguments which idealists use, and I think it's worth us learning to recognise where idealism, how it sort of emerges, how it, uh, how it presents itself, and the arguments which are used, and the counter-arguments which we as Marxists, as dialectical materialists, uh, lay down in opposition to idealism. And finally, of course, what um, you know, what is the uh, relevance of this for us as revolutionaries? This is what it all has to come back to. You know, we as revolutionary Marxists describe ourselves as materialists, dialectical materialists. Um, uh, there are other brands of materialism. Uh, what uh, distinguishes our ideas, if you like? Um, and so, uh, first of all, I want to talk about, as I say, the emergence of idealism. It seems like a very strange... Uh, thing, this idea that, that, that uh, consciousness is somehow independent of the material world, but it was very much um, in the, it, it was very much, um, what's the word? A common sense and easy to understand how this uh, sort of thing emerged actually amongst primitive human beings. 
if you go back hundreds of thousands of years, I described how we as human beings tend to actually bring the forces of nature under our control through the means of labour. But of course, the earliest human beings had barely emerged from the animal kingdom. They had begun to transform their world around them, begun to sort of bring the forces of nature under their control. But it was only a beginning. And in many respects, of course, primitive human beings were barely distinguished from the animal kingdom, had barely emerged from the animal kingdom. And the forces of nature, far from actually being under the control of human beings, were barely even understood whatsoever. We've seen it's the, the earliest mind would have been grasping in the dark, trying to understand the world around it and uh, coming up with all sorts of explanations, magical and mystical explanations. And we see independently in all sorts of parts of the world the emergence of uh, very similar animistic religions, the attribution to nature of consciousness, of spirits, all, all sorts of things inhabiting nature, and therefore also the possibility of actually controlling nature, of bringing nature under our control. If everything is, sub is subject to these sort of spirits which inhabit it in this, these animistic religions, of course those spirits could be appealed to, uh, you can beg them to sort of change their ways, you know, to be, less, to, to be less capricious or what have you. Or on the other hand, you can threaten those spirits and, uh, you know, the, or threaten your, these gods, if you like, um, these primitive gods. Um, and uh, this, so you see that actually superstition and idealist modes of thought were very much sort of connected with attempts to control the natural. The supernatural and the natural sort of merged in together. Um, and of course, that was... Uh, easy to understand how people saw that there were spirits in nature. After all, do we not sort of, um, when we sleep, does our consciousness not seem to rise out of our body? Do we not seem to carry on walking around in our dreams, interacting with people who are perhaps dead, you know, or, or passed away, our ancestors and so on? So it was, it was, uh, it was quite natural for primitive peoples to come to these ideas, these animistic conclusions, and try to bring nature under their control through means of exerting control over the supernatural. But of course, um, to, to, to raise above that, to, uh, to explain nature purely in terms of nature, it was necessary to have a development of the productive forces, uh, to bring nature more and more under our control. And it's particularly amongst the Greeks that we see, um, of course, a, uh, a high level of development of philosophy, and one of the first attempts within Europe to really uh, explain <clears throat> nature through the processes of nature. And we, a lot of uh, comrades may have been actually at the discussion on dialectics, so if you were there, I won't necessarily uh, bore you with that, uh, because uh, a lot of that has already been covered. Um, and it's remarkable the fact that the majority, actually, of the Greek philosophers were materialists, and particularly the earlier Ionian philosophers as, as, that Scott was talking about earlier on, were um, materialists. They didn't have any recourse to the supernatural. That was all expelled from nature. There were attempts to explain nature in terms of nature. However, of course, there were very definite limits to the uh, materialism of the uh, ancient Greeks. Uh, First of all, of course, it was not a, a, you know, a revolutionary materialism for the liberation of, a, of a, an oppressed class. It was the materialism of a, of a slave-owning aristocracy within ancient Greece. And actually, the, uh, Lucretius, one of the great Roman uh, materialists, described his materialism as a, bit, a, a little bit like being a, uh, um, a man with his feet firmly on the shore looking over a stormy bay. And you can see the ships are getting battered and so forth. Um, and you have a feeling of calm washes over yourself. So by understanding the laws of nature, it gives you a certain sense of internal calm and peace. Uh, whereas you see all of the other peoples around you are you know, full of superstition and so on and are completely uh, unable to explain the laws of nature around them. So it was a thing of personal consumption for the ruling class and it had a very qualitative nature. Uh, to it. If you actually read the writings of people like Lucretius and so on, you see that they, uh, they have much more of the, the, a sense of poetry. There is, these are not like scientific papers and what have you with like, you know, long mathematical details and so on. Um, there was, uh, um, uh, obviously there were limits to the degree to which science could be developed amongst the ancient Greeks uh, and among, within ancient society in general. Um, but at the same time as you had the emergence of uh, materialist philosophy, um, you also had strong impulses in the direction of idealist philosophy at the same time, uh, which also emerged with the emergence of class society. You have, the, uh, of course, the division between manual and mental labour, which was a result of the fact that a certain layer of the population were freed from the burden of labour by the labour of the slaves, who could who obviously fed the, uh, you know, the, 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 the Platos and the Pythagoras of the ancient world. And therefore, uh, a tendency to actually elevate uh, mental labour above manual labour. Uh, and at the same time, you see in particular in uh, uh, um, 
uh, in, in our more abstract thoughts, you know, such as in mathematics and so on, a tendency to forget the relationship that our abstractions about the world have to the concrete material world around us. Um, so we see in Plato, his, he had this idea that you had a, uh, a world of uh, perfect forms that existed on another plane separate to the sort of uh, the material world. And that uh, if we see, for example, roundness within nature, if we see a plate is round, a, uh, a, the moon is round, and uh, you know, the sun is round, that these all reflect a, a perfect round circular form that exists on another plane separate and independent from the material world. And the material world is simply an imperfect reflection of uh, this, this realm of ideas and so on. In other words, our abstractions had a, a sort of separate existence to the concrete world around us. Um, the, the essence of things was separated from the appearance of things. And you can see that there was uh, particularly the times that Plato was actually, um, you know, that Plato uh, was thinking in, were extremely tumultuous times. You had the defeat at, at the end of the Peloponnesian War, the 30 tyrants uh, that dominated in, in that period, particularly of uh, Plato's youth. And this had a formative effect on his consciousness, a tendency in periods of decline and crisis for a polarization within philosophy of some people turning away actually from the material world, which seems to be run by you know, irrational people uh, that seems to bear no resemblance to sort of any rationality or reason, that reason has abandoned the world in periods of decline and therefore a turn to a perfect world of which the material world is merely an imperfect reflection and expression. Um, and uh, yeah, so and particularly that period of the decline and fall of the Roman Empire was one such period of um, where everything seemed to be completely uh, you know unreasonable. The world seemed to be in a, a period of decline. There was despair that uh, infected not just the lower classes within society but sections of the aristocracy, uh, sections of the old ruling class, and a tendency for mysticism to creep in. Um, and pessimism to creep in, and a, a tendency to see the, the possibility of a better life in the hereafter, because there was no possibility of sort of improving one's life in the, in the present. And all of these mystical ideas injected into the declining Roman Empire with the, the growth of different cults, the growth of um, uh, the spread of the Jewish and the Christian religions throughout the empire. We see that uh, in periods of decline and crisis, a tendency amongst certain sections of the population to turn in a mystical direction, to turn away from the material world. So we see all of these elements uh, which gave rise to the, uh, the, the, the potential for the domination of idealism throughout a whole period of human history, particularly in the feudal period, idealist conception, conceptions of the world when, this, when the, uh, the, the Christian religion merged with the uh, Roman ruling class to form the Roman Catholic Church. The feudal uh, church, which was based upon many of the ideas of Plato and some of the ideas of Aristotle injected into to <coughs> Christian theology, uh, idealism became the official state philosophy. And it became the divine justification for the material order that existed, for the interests of a particular ruling class, which was a, and, and the Catholic Church, of course, was in many respects the subjective factor in the transition from the old declining slave society towards the new feudal order. Um, now, I don't have much time to, to, uh, to go into you know, all of those developments, but it's interesting um, at the same time that this was, of course, a massive step back relative to the achievements of the, uh, the, the cultural achievements of antiquity, the, uh, what stands out in the period of the Middle Ages, despite some attempts to revise this assessment, is a period of darkness. In fact, much of philosophy was only really retained amongst uh, you know, the Arab populations, the, the uh, Muslim Al-Andalus in the uh, Iberian Peninsula. Um, <clears throat> but you did have the, the, the re-emergence of civilization, the re, the, the, uh, a growth after this sort of throwback um, within uh, Europe. And the emergence, of course, particularly in the uh, areas that of, uh, between the great landed estates, you had the emergence of a bourgeoisie, of a class of, of, um, of traders, of artisans and merchants in the, uh, um, like in the nooks and crannies of feudal society. And increasingly, this, this class emerged, which increasingly depended for its wealth upon money rather than landed property. And this bourgeois, uh, the bourgeoisie as a class uh, in its revolutionary phase, of course, came into conflict with the old ruling class, with the old feudal fuel elite. And it is, a t it is a testament to the correctness, actually, of the materialist method that in its first opposition, of course, it took the intellectual material which existed in the world around it. The first opposition of the bourgeoisie to the old feudal regime and to the Catholic Church took the uh, expression of, an, of a religious opposition, 
of purifying the old Catholic Church of all of the trappings of feudalism and so forth and a return of purification and a return to the original Christian religion. Of course, this was not a return to the, re the religion of the, uh, of the 12 apostles and what have you. This was actually the purification of all of the feudal rubbish and the creation actually of a bourgeois god. The Protestant religion in many respects represented the interests of the bourgeoisie as opposed to the old feudal god. Um, and in the English Civil War, the ideology under which uh, Oliver Cromwell's army fought was of a purified religion, and the same in, in, uh, um, in, in Germany as well. It was of, uh, of, under Luther. The Reformation and the Peasant War was fought under the banner of uh, a purified religion. And it's, it's interesting, actually, that within uh, decaying feudal society, the, the extreme left wing, for example, in the Reformation within Germany, amongst the Anabaptists, you had a movement in the direction of complete philosophical op opposition to God and the Catholic Church under the guise of uh, pantheism. A sort of pantheistic atheism was beginning to emerge on the extreme left wing, representing the most radical uh, petty, uh, ele elements of the petty bourgeoisie and semi-proletarian semi layers within Germany. Um, but uh, as the um, bourgeois revolutions developed on a higher level, particularly in the period prior to the French Revolution, you have the emergence of the bourgeoisie using a militant materialism in opposition to the old feudal uh, ideas of the Catholic Church. And uh, um, in particular in France in the period of the 18th century, in the pr period of the preparation before the French Revolution, you have the spread of all sorts of uh, revolutionary ideas which uh, in many, many of the philosophers within this period were themselves materialists. Man was to become the measure of everything. They, were, they saw themselves as bringing in a new epoch of reason, of the rights of man, of justice and equality and so on. And um, in many respects they were actually influenced by earlier bourgeois philosophers such as uh, the, the British uh, materialists uh, Francis uh, Bacon and um, John Locke who were amongst the... Uh, the Locke in particular was a massive influence to the French materialists of the period of the 18th century. Now I think it's worth us pausing for a second to look at what is the relationship between the bourgeoisie as a class and the two great camps within philosophy between materialism and idealism. And we can see in a certain sense of course a reason why the bourgeoisie particularly in its revolutionary phase and even to this day to a certain extent will promote a certain brand of materialism. On the one hand the bourgeoisie has an interest in the development of science and science itself was one of the fields of battle between the Catholic Church and the rising bourgeoisie in the, in the, uh, in the period of the uh, uh, late Middle Ages. <clears throat> and at the same time, of course, the bourgeoisie comes into opposition against the, uh, the old Catholic Church. And uh, amongst its most radical and revolutionary representatives, you get the rise of this militant mat uh, materialism. Who Engels describes the materialists in France as uh, heralding the, the, the bourgeois revolution in France, but they were by no means had uh, the same bourgeois limitations of the class which they were representing as in their revolutionary ideological struggle in the 18th century. Um, and uh, so I think it's worth particularly pausing on the ideas of the sort of materialism which was developing at this time and looking at it in a bit more depth, and the arguments that the idealists used in counter to this sort of uh, this, um, this materialism. So uh, Locke in particular took as his starting point the, uh, the idea that knowledge um, has only one source really, that, that, that the source of knowledge is the external world around us. It is our sensations uh, provides the source of knowledge. And they provide a window to a material world which exists independently and outside of ourselves. And then we take this information from our sensations uh, we process it in our mind, and through deductive logic we're able to tease out the laws of nature and of the material world, which you very much saw as existing independently. Um, now it's interesting that some of the, uh, his opponents, who uh, came from an idealist or an agnostic camp, that is to say they didn't exert the, the, the primacy of mat a material world uh, outside of ourselves, people like David Hume, they were sort of, uh, they, they denied the, the knowability even of a material world. Is there a world out there they didn't know? Sort of. So there are camps between materialism and idealism. But people like Bishop Berkeley, who was an idealist philosopher, and David Hume, who was uh, opposed to materialism from an agnostic point of view, actually took as their starting point the very same uh, starting point as Locke and drew the exact opposite conclusion. They said, okay, we agree that the only source of... Uh, the, they, in, the, in turn, agreed that the only source of knowledge is sensations. All that we know to be real are our sensations. I see this, I hear that, I, I smell that, and, 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 and taste such and such. Uh, 
Um, this is all that we know to be real, but what we conceive of as matter, or what we conceive of as things, if you like, are merely correlations of sensations. That's all I can say. For example, if I have an apple before me, I see red, I taste sweet and crunchy, uh, it has a round form. I associate those, correlate those things, and give them a, uh, a name. I call it an apple. And therefore, all that this is, is really an idea. It exists purely as an idea. Now, Hume said it's impossible to know, actually, if there is a material world beyond these sensations that is causing these sensations to be created. Uh, Bishop Berkeley took the, a quite categorical opinion that they didn't exist except in the mind, if you like, and there was no evidence for the material world. And the lawfulness of the world was simply the fact that God was planting in our minds these ideas. These sensations were directly implanted in our minds from God. Um, so it was a very clear idealist position that Bishop Berkeley took. Um, um, so as you see, for the materialists, our sensations act almost as a window to the external world. For the uh, agnostic and for the idealist, our sensations are like a fence which are insurpassable, if you like. And um, Diderot, the French uh, materialist, described this philosophy as a little bit like if you imagine a sentient piano and you play the keys of the piano in the same way that our senses are played upon by nature. Um, and he described this philosophy as a bit like a piano that imagined that there was no such thing as a pianist playing its keys, that all of the world's uh, harmonies existed purely within its head. We would surely describe that as a completely insane piano. And in the same way, he describes uh, idealism as the most insane philosophy. It is the most absurd philosophy, yet he described it as the most devilishly difficult to actually disprove. How, do you know, how can you actually disprove that there is a material world out there? Now, Diderot, to his credit, came very close to a dialectical materialist point of view, he, 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 although he didn't quite overcome the limits that uh, most of the French materialists, all of the French materialists were subject to. So I think it's worth us then having a look at um, what were the limits that we as Marxists uh, would describe of this sort of materialism that existed in the, in the revolutionary period of the bourgeoisie as a class. Um, well, en Engels actually described three fundamental limits to this sort of, uh, what he described as metaphysical materialism. And, uh, um, and Lenin also picked up on those in his book, uh, Materialism and Imperial Criticism, which I recommend all comrades read. And I also recommend everyone read uh, another book, a short book by Engels, called uh, Ludwig Feuerbach and the, and the End of Classical German Philosophy. It's not very long. It's reasonably accessible. Uh, any, all, a lot of the names, though, you can obviously look on Wikipedia and stuff, uh, but it's, it's very good. Um, and uh, Lenin descri uh, sorry, Engels and Lenin described three real uh, limitations to this materialism. On the one hand, they described it very much as being a materialism of a mechanical character. Um, and I, as uh, I think I mentioned previously, actually, in Scott's discussion on dialectics, what they meant by that was, of course, in the, in the period um, that we're talking about, um, even by the time you get to the late 18th century, in which the French materialists were writing, um, science was still yet to be put on a scientific basis in many fields, particularly chemistry and biology, lagged behind physics and astronomy, which had far superseded them, had, had, had marched far ahead. And according to um, simple mechanics and according to astronomy, the world operates according to these uh, unchanging laws of simple cause and effect. Um, and, uh, you know, you have the eternal rotations and of, of, the, uh, of the motions of the heavens and so on, which very much appear like a piece of clockwork. And uh, these mechanical laws of motion were applied to try and explain by these philosophers the world of chemistry and biology and so on. And you see attempts to explain uh, organisms also as uh, merely pieces of clockwork. And Descartes, for example, was a very mechanical uh, philosopher. He imagined that animals were purely nothing but complex machines. They were very complex or, uh, <coughs> machines that uh, 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 operated according to very deterministic laws. And actually, he described us as human beings as being merely machines that were, uh, on the other hand, inhabited by consciousness that connected somewhere in our brain. He imagined there was some sort of like God organ in the brain. Um, and you see this, this uh, develops in, in uh, different periods within neuroscience as well, actually, this idea that there is some sort of controlling center within the brain. Because when you have a, mat a mechanical materialist conception, you imagine that the, the brain operates in the same way that uh, billiard balls operate when they interact with each other or a piece of clockwork operates. Where do you find the consciousness in that? If the, if the brain is nothing more than the, 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 the individual sum of its parts, operating by very strict deterministic uh, um, 
laws of uh, uh, me mechanics, if you like. So it's very difficult to solve this question of where does consciousness fit into a mechanical universe. On the other hand, um, they dis uh, the Engels criticised this materialism as being uh, very much anti-dialectical. And now, uh, if we go back to Locke, for example, who described the, the one source of our knowledge as being um, our sensations that give us a window onto the outside world. That is true to a certain extent. But of course, do we simply speculate about the world around us? Do we just simply allow our sensations to, to, to bombard us from all directions and then draw conclusions about the world? Um, no, and natural scientists don't operate in that manner. In actual fact, we also act upon the world. And actually, we act upon the world before we even begin to think about the world. As I explained previously, in the, uh, um, in, in, in the beginning, human beings began transforming the world, and in so doing, laid the basis for human mind, human consciousness, human culture. That's the meaning of what Marx talks about when he said uh, in his thesis on Feuerbach, the, 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 uh, the philosophers have only interpreted the world in various ways. The point, however, is to change it. And practice plays a very important role in the question of the, the truthfulness of our knowledge. Is there a material world which corresponds to these laws that I have described and hypothesized uh, from, from observation? Well, the scientist does is they go into the laboratory and they test those things. They put those things into practice. And practice is, a, for Marxists, a key category in the theory of knowledge. It is uh, something which was disdained by many philosophers prior to Marx. And of course, for us as revolutionaries, as revolutionary communists, we see that actually uh, there are a lot of people who uh, put forward the idea that the level of consciousness of the working class is too low. That the, uh, first of all, we have to educate everyone one by one, and eventually when consciousness reaches a certain level, it will be possible for the working class to transform society. But it's actually through the class struggle, it's actually through revolutions that the working class achieves its class consciousness and achieves its level of organisation. It can be through no other means than through changing the world and entering into struggle that the working class achieves a certain level of class consciousness and is able to finally transform society. Um, so for, for us as, as Marxists, we are not simply speculative uh, materialists, we are dialectical materialists. We see that action forms a key part of our philosophy. And finally... Uh, Engels describes how these uh, materialists were limited to a certain idealism, uh, sort of materialism below, but idealism above, as he described it. In other words, um, on the one hand, whilst they described nature in terms of nature, they didn't imagine that a supernatural existed. Um, and they, uh, you know, the French materialists in particular, were completely implacably opposed to the idea of God and mysticism and, and, and all that sort of stuff. And as I said, create, made man the measure of things. Nevertheless, this was not man historically given as, as uh, the representative of a particular class or division or group within society at a given historical stage in society. This was man in the abstract that had certain abstract human rights and a human nature. The rights of man would have been completely laughable, like to the ancient Romans, the idea that everyone has inherent rights, because actually a certain section of humanity were slaves, and the whole basis of their civilization was one of slavery. What these, uh, the, the, the kind of ideals that the French materialists were fighting for were really the ideals of the bourgeois republic, of uh, the, the, the freedom to trade, uh, equality before the law. They represented the interests of a certain class, but of course they didn't express it as this. They expressed it in terms of transcend transcendental ideas of rights, justice, and so on. In other words, there was no connection between these ideas, if you like, in the material world. To go beyond that materialism of the, uh, of the great revolutionary materialists in France and others uh, would ne necessarily mean seeing the bourgeois epoch as one stage in human society and one stage of human development, of seeing that materialism as simply being the materialism of a revolutionary bourgeois class. In other words, it would have, mean, it would have meant taking the class point of view of a proletariat, of a new revolutionary class that is in opposition to the bourgeoisie. Um, and of developing such a position, which of course was impossible for these thinkers at the time uh, when the, the proletariat was basically uh, barely emerging as a class. There were very much limits to which they could develop this materialism. Um, and so it's, uh, it's fairly understandable why they came to these conclusions. Now I've gone into a lot of depth as to, of course, the materialism of the bourgeoisie in, a revolution, in its revolutionary phase. And the differences between bourgeois material, yeah, sorry, I won't call it bourgeois materialism, mechanical, metaphysical materialism, and dialectical materialism, which is the philosophy of Marxism. However, I think it's also quite clear that today, the bourgeoisie, whilst there are bourgeois materialists, the bourgeoisie as a class is also the greatest funder and uh, backer of all forms of organized re uh, religion, all forms of mysticism and attempts to sort of uh, um, 
uh, if you like, uh, cloak the reality of the world around us um, in, in mysticism. Um, that the bourgeoisie as a class, particularly once it has become a ruling class, we can see has an interest in uh, propelling certain uh, forms of idealism forward um, in different guises, uh, some more subtle, some less so. Um, and in fact, I quite like, uh, there's a little dialogue in Les Miserables between uh, the good bishop, who of course is an idealist, as one might expect from a bishop, and the, uh, the bourgeois senator who describes his, uh, he describes his materialism because he says, I'm a materialist. You know what? I'm born, I live, and I die. And uh, whilst I, I, you know, I have a, I'm fortunate to be a wealthy man, I can enjoy good wine, good food, and so on. Uh, you know, this materialism was very much the materialism of a bourgeois. He's not going to deny himself material things in life if he knows he's not going to live in the next life. It was not very different from the, from the materialism of Lucretius and the materialism of the slave-owning class, except far more hypocritical, because the guy then goes on to say, yes, but there is, a room, there is room for idealism. There is room for your philosophy, he says to the bishop. It's the, uh, it's the butter that, that the... Uh, sorry, God is what the, uh, the poor man butters his dry bread with. In other words, it's a means of solace for the, for the working class. It's a, it's a means of solace for the poor and the oppressed classes within society. And he goes on a raging rant about Diderot and these revolutionaries in France because he's a very conservative sort of thing. Um, and he sees the, the, the room for religion, for mysticism. Um, and uh, of, of, of course, we can quite clearly see um, you know, why that is the case. But I think this, this points in the direction of why our, for us as Marxists, we are obviously materialists and we're, you know, we are scientific socialists and we are atheists, therefore. But our atheism has nothing to do with that certain um, strand of atheism described as like new, the new atheists and so on. That strand of bourgeois atheism that you see from people like Richard Dawkins and other um, you know, uh, essentially bourgeois atheists who see their own atheism as being, uh, you know, gives them a certain... Um, Superiority, they feel a bit superior. If there's, if there's atheism, you know, if, if, if there are peoples in other parts of the world that are killing each other supposedly because of religion, you know, if there are death cults that supposedly believe in some god in the Middle East, or, you know, there are, uh, you know, uh, Buddhists in Myanmar or what have you chopping off uh, the limbs of people, this is because of their backwardness and their, you know, actually it, it tends to lead to all sorts of racist and, uh, uh, you know, extremely. Um, backward conclusions on the part of these so-called new atheists. Um, actually ignoring the fact of something that we looked at in another session on terrorism is that where do all of these movements spawn? Actually, it's the same imperialists in the secular, developed, advanced countries that are at the same time backing the most backward, uh, mystical sort of sects and, and, and these, so you know, these death cults and terrorist groups in other parts of the world. You know, it's the same French ruling class that bans the, you know, the burqa in, in, you know, in the name of secularism and having an advanced sort of, you know... Uh, it's complete hypocrisy, obviously, and that has nothing to do with the, the atheism of us as Marxists. For us as Marxists, our atheism is, uh, our critique of religion is a critique of the material circumstances that seek people to try and find solace in a hereafter, you know, in a better world when you're dead, basically. We say, let's build heaven on earth. Let's not wait until the afterlife to actually build, uh, to, to, to go to heaven. Uh, um, so, uh, and, but, of course, between the, the, the most... Um, if you like, um, what's the word? Uh, blatant and undisguised and naked idealism and materialism, there are much more subtle attempts to sort of uh, introduce idealism into the working class uh, movement, introduce uh, this sort of philosophy in the interest of the bourgeoisie. For example, I mean, I might describe how, um, I might say, uh, you as a worker, if, you have, if you're working 40, 50 hours a week uh, um, you know, for crap pay, uh, if you're lucky working that many hours a week, or uh, if, you, if you're, you know, you're living in a damp, rat-infested house or whatever else, uh, if your healthcare system is falling apart and, and, and all of these sort of things, uh, it's because of the objective laws of capitalism. As a scientific socialist, I explain that it is the, uh, it is the exploitation of the working class which leads to this situation that you're living in. The, the bourgeois idealist, on the other hand, will turn around and say, you know, what do you mean there are objective laws of capitalism? There is no objective laws of capitalism. In fact, uh, you might not like eating soup with dry bread, but some people love that sort of thing. You know, some people love to just live off of uh, crap food. And, and, okay, you call that a hovel, but for someone else, that is like a palace, you know. Uh, in other words, the only truth that exists in the world is that subjective truth that exists in your head, and so, therefore stop complaining. Some people like working hard. 
uh, you know, a very subjectivist outlook. You can see how that leads to, um, um, you know, the idea that you should give up in your in, in, in the, any attempt to try and change the world. And we see this given a philosophical justification in university campuses and so on. I know there was a session on postmodernism, I didn't go to that, but what postmodern, I mean, it's very difficult to actually uh, uh, describe post postmodernism as like a coherent theory, but all it really is is a, a rejection of any sort of um, meta narrative. The idea that there is some sort of like uh, overarching objective laws to society is completely dispensed with. In other words, there is only your own subjective view and how you subjectively see things. And therefore, you know, if you want to sort of like, you know, fight for environmentalism or, you know, uh, you know, uh, struggle for equality of, you know, LGBT people or, uh, you know, women's rights and, and all of these sort of things, uh, that's fair enough. But the idea that there are objective laws to society and you have to smash capitalism to solve these things, no, it's purely subjective. In other words, it serves to ideologically justify all of this identity politics and dividing the working class basically by gender, religion, race and all of these sort of categories. Um, so we see how it, it, it works its way into the, to the left, you know, through the, through the universities, uh, you know, through the, uh, the media, uh, not simply through the means of uh, the conveyor belt of religion. Idealist philosophy finds its way in all sorts of ways also into the working class movement. And here's the point. The point is if you don't have your own philosophy, you're going to absorb the philosophy of the world around you, right? And how can we conceive of the working class transforming society without, first of all, adopting its own independent class point? In other words, un until the working class has a clear uh, view of the world, which is independent of the view of the world that the bourgeoisie hold, there is no question on earth of the working class being able to liberate itself. Uh, until it has a party which is led by a certain philosophy, dialectical materialism, there is no possibility of the working class achieving its own liberation. And we see that within the working class movement, actually, um, idealist concepts, uh, not consciously expressed as idealism, but they find themselves left, right, and centre. In Britain, uh, for ex example, yeah, no, 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 getting a bit dry. <laughs> um, there is the idea that, uh, oh, thank you. Um, there is, amongst the leaders of the trade unions and the Labour Party, there is this idea that actually austerity and cuts and attacks on the working class are merely ideological in character. Um, of course, they are ideological in character, as, as, uh, as in fact the Tory party does have a certain ideology, and they are carrying out this austerity which is in line with their ideology. But for us as Marxists, of course, ideology is not grounded, is, is, you know, doesn't, have its, uh, doesn't live in the air separate from the material world. Actually, that ideology corresponds to a certain class interest. It corresponds to the interests of the bourgeoisie, the capitalist class as a class. And in the period of crisis, they are determined to pass on the, 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 the basically that the working class will pay for this crisis through all of this austerity and attacks. But the conclusions you are led to draw, if you simply think this is an ideological attack, um, and it's because of the anti-working class ideology, which for some reason unexplained enters the heads of these Tory politicians, you are left with the conclusion that simply changing the politicians or even convincing and converting the politicians away from this insane ideology towards a more compassionate and rational ideology would lead to the end of austerity and would lead to an end of the attacks upon the working class. Um, in fact, that's, uh, that's a very old idea. That is not something that has been invented by the trade union leaders or the Labour Party leaders. Mm. That is the, uh, the ideology, actually, of the utopian socialists. The pre-Marxist socialists had this point of view, that it was only necessary to, conv to convince the ruling class um, of the, the superiority of socialism. People like Robert Owen actually <coughs> tried to appeal to the better nature of the capitalist class. Um, and they completely failed, of course. But we can understand why the utopian socialists drew that conclusion, because the material conditions were not ripe for the development of, a, of an actual materialist, scientific, socialist view of the world. We're not right for Marxism because the working class as a class was still, still too small, still too underdeveloped, not uh, sufficiently independent as a class and organised as a class. For trade union leaders at the head of trade unions with six me million members plus to continue to hold those views of the, uh, the, the, these idealist views of the pre-Marxist utopian socialists is something unforgivable in my Opinion. However, we understand they do not have their own philosophy. Therefore, they absorb the bits of philosophy from the society around them. We understand how that comes about. And of course, Marx and Engels started their life as philosophers, as students of philosophy. And for them, 
uh, the, the, the communism, if you like, um, Marxism, the, those ideas of the, the revolutionary transformation of society started out with, a, uh, with working out their own philosophical point of view. And for you know, Lenin and Trotsky as well, um, I haven't had time to go into really Lenin's book, Materialism and Imperial Criticism, although a lot of the arguments that I've laid down are, are found in that book. Um, he too saw it as the, uh, in the period after the 1905 revolution when you had a wave of mysticism as a, as a result of the, uh, the defeat of the, the revolutionary movement and idealism finding its expression within the Bolshevik party. He saw it as necessary to publish a book actually um, explaining why we are materialists and laying down all of the arguments against idealism in its various different forms. And therefore the defense of the materialist method, the defense of dialectical materialism, is the defense of the building of the revolutionary party. That is actually the starting point of the building of a party, is the defense of this theory. Because after all, the party is simply the mechanism by which to actually bring this philosophy and this outlook of the world into the working class movement.